So here we have the recall session for the UPSC surgery questions. So I think everyone would have given a good shot because from our topics and the slides which we have covered, we have got almost uh, 10 to 15 direct questions from the slides alone. And in addition, along with the uh, materials and topics which you had discussed and uh, along with the question bank materials, we have a strike rate of almost 80 to 90 percentage questions have come from the materials provided from our side. So I hope everyone would have given a good shot for the exam. And we can look at the questions review once more and check up on the uh, questions and the options for the UPSC exam. Just a recall session. Okay. So here we have the first question. So which one of the following statements regarding inflammatory bowel disease is correct? So the options are, option A, rectum is always involved in Crohn's disease. Option B, fistula formation is uh, common in ulcerative colitis. So it's a typing error here. Option C, stricture formation is common in ulcerative colitis. And uh, option D, perianal disease. Perianal manifestations is common among common Crohn's disease. So... Let's uh, have a comparison between the Crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis. And this comparison we have already discussed in the class sessions with a long table, if you remember. So looking at the options, first option, rectum is always involved in Crohn's disease. Is it true? So basically, rectum is not always involved in the Crohn's disease. Basically, it's the ulcerative colitis. When you say about ulcerative colitis, the symptoms of the ulcerative colitis start from the anus and go proximally in a continuous fashion. And in almost all the cases, the rectum is involved in ulcerative colitis. That is why in ulcerative colitis, bloody diarrhea are one of the very common symptoms. Second, so first point is wrong. Okay, in when you come to Crohn's disease. Only in around 50 percentage, only in around 50 percentage of the case of Crohn's disease, we have rectal involvement. Okay, others have rectal sparing. Rectum can be spared in ulcerative colitis in half of the population. Second point here is fistula formation. Fistula formation is common in ulcerative colitis. So fistula means between two bowel loops. Two bowel loops, there is a connection. Okay, so when there is a connection between the so this is the first bowel loop and this is the second bowel loop and this is the fistula connection, suppose. Suppose this connection is to happen means the outermost layer of each bowel loop, that is the serosal layer of each bowel loop should be involved. Then only there can be attachment and fistula formation. So basically how does this fistula formation occur? There is inflammation of the or inflammation extending till the serosal layer. From inside, the inflammation is extending till the serosal layer of one bowel loop, and this results in attachment of nearby bowel serosa. That is the basis behind the fistula formation. Then a connection set up between the two bowel loops. That is how fistula forms. So, in order to get this connection, initially serosa, serosa must be inflamed. And in which disease we have serosal inflammation, whether ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Where do we have serosal inflammation? In Crohn's disease, we have serosal inflammation. Because in Crohn's disease, we have full thickness. Full thickness of the bubble is involved due to the inflammation in Crohn's disease. Okay, in ulcerative colitis, only the mucosa and submucosa are involved in the inflammation. So, fistula formation is more common in Crohn's disease and uh, this option is wrong here, third option. Structure formation is common in ulcerative colitis. Again, again, the same thing applies. In order to form structures, in, it's common in both ulcerative, actually, ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease. In both, we can find structures. Okay, so when inside the bubble, when there is injury or ulceration or defects in the mucosa, submucosa and all, they heal by fibrosis. So they heal by fibrosis. This fibrosis and healing results in structure formation 
and constriction of the bowel. But when there is full thickness, when there is full thickness inflammation, that is, which is more common in Crohn's disease. Okay, in Crohn's disease, there is full thickness uh, uh, inflammation. As a result, there is more stricture formation. So all those strictures can be seen in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It's more common in which one? It's more common in Crohn's disease. So option three, option three is also it's partially correct, but still we can keep it. It's questionable. Okay, because it's more common. Stitches are seen more common in Crohn's disease. And fourth option is perianal disease. Perianal disease is more common in Crohn's disease. That is a correct answer. Okay, so perianal disease is in fact very common in Crohn's disease. There can be uh, anything like uh, ranging from perianal fissures to fistulas. All this can be seen in Crohn's disease and this is not a feature of ulcerative colitis. So when there is perianal involvement or perianal disease is present, we can choose that as the correct answer. Okay, that is the most suiting. It is true that perianal disease is common in Crohn's disease. So option B is the correct answer here. So, we can go to the next question. A Sengston Blackmore tube is used for management of which among the conditions? So, Sengston Blackmore tube, the answer here is it can be used for management of option 2, that is vericial bleed. So, what is a Sengston Blackmore tube? So, when you get a patient who is actively bleeding, Okay, actively having vericial bleed. What you can do? You can insert this thing taken black more tube. Active severe bleeds. Okay, not in mild bleeds, not in septal bleeds, but patient is continuously vomiting. And you know that the patient is having varices, esophageal varices. So we have this stomach here. And here I'm marking with uh, blue ink the varices okay it can be just varices also and they are bleeding so varices are bleeding so here in this image we have the things taken black mode tube and this tube this tube has a gastric balloon as well as an esophageal balloon okay now you're going to insert this tube through the nose of the patient into the esophagus so here the tube comes in and the tip, the gastric balloon part, it is entering the stomach. Now, you can inflate this esophageal balloon. Okay, esophageal balloon is inflated. So, what happens? The esophageal balloon gives a tamponade effect or the balloon pushes or gives a pressure over the varices. And in case, in case the bleed is from gastric varices, that is the fundic varices, you can very well use the inflate the gastric balloon and pull it against the fundus pull it against the hiatus you can give a pull from here so you can address all type of readings using a sengstegen blackmore tube so it is used in case of varices now we can look at the third question the most common brain tumor of the liver is again this is yet another point directly from the topics we have discussed in our class and even this exact point is mentioned in one of our slides if you remember so the most common brain tumor in liver the answer the options are adenoma hemangioma focal nodular hypoplasia and angiomyolipoma and your answer is option b hemangioma so if you look at the brain tumors of liver all these given options they form brain tumors in the liver the most common is hemangioma Next, the best position to palpate the minimal enlargement of spleen is options are supine with limbs extended. So the patient is saying supine and you are going to palpate. Second option is palpation of left subcostal area in right lateral decubitus position. Patient is lying towards right turn to its side so that the spleen is in the upper part okay. so it is expected due to gravity the spleen is pulled downwards 
Third option is by manual palpation in supine position. And fourth option is palpation of a left subcostal area in knee elbow position. Remember this option, which is the best position to palpate the minimally enlarged spleen. So it should be noted that splenic enlargement only when it becomes three times the normal size. Only when the spring becomes three times its normal size, it can be palpable. Okay, so when the uh, expansion of the spring or enlargement is less than three times, it might be difficult to normally palpate. So we have these uh, specific ways, different methods. Among them, for a minimally enlarged spring, the specific method of palpation is palpation, option B, palpation of the left subcostal area in the right lateral debitus position. So check this image here. In this image, the patient is turning towards the right side. It's the right decubitus position. And if you are hooking or palpating in the subcostal margin, due to the effect of gravity, the enlarged spring will be more palpable. And this is the normal way of Palpation of spleen. Now, even there are methods which are described in palpation of spleen in children and all, where even difficult to palpate spleens, the child can be made to jump a few times. After jumping, you can hook the left uh, costal margin to palpate the spleen. All these methods are described, but however, for our question, the answer is option number B. Now, checking at the next question. A young 28 year old male was operated for urinary ulcer. Now, it is done for perforation peritonitis of urinary ulcer, that is a perforated urinary ulcer. And after having recorded for recorded well for five days, he developed fever and chills. So, post operative fever and chills, post op after five days. And symptoms of toxemia was also there. So he developed right shoulder pain. So when you speak about right shoulder pain, shoulder tip pain, and intractable hiccups, what can you think? Something is irritating the diaphragm. Okay, so intractable hiccups are there, and pain is also referred to the right shoulder. So that is very much indicative that the uh, something is going to irritate the diaphragm. And the question is the most likely diagnosis. So the options are, first one is surgical site infection. Second one is post-operative peritonitis. So surgical site infection, that is uh, very less likely to uh, irritate the diaphragm because where is the incision? Incision is in the midline commonly. When it comes to a uh, perforation peritonitis, we open the whole abdomen through a long laparotomy, midline laparotomy. Okay. And uh, second option, post-operative peritonitis. It's uh, very less likely because during the surgery, we are going to give a good adequate wash. And the third option is subphrenic abscess. So we have the liver here. Sometimes, sometimes adequate wash and removal of the septic foci may be missed. Okay. Or even after giving adequate wash, there will be symbol for a very few remnants of the pustules or the inf infective material within the peritoneal cavity. So it can form a, an abscess in this subdiaphragmatic region. And this can, of course, it is a possibility that it is going to irritate the diaphragm. And there are uh, shoulder tip pain and intractable hiccups. Fourth option is the right lobe of liver abscess. If the liver abscess also can result in irritation of diaphragm. When there is a right lobe of liver abscess, but but for the given situation, for the given case condition, that is after a perforation peritonitis, this bacteria are unlikely. The bacteria released into the peritoneal cavity or the pus material, all these are unlikely to invade the liver substance. Unlikely. Why? Because the liver is contained within the glycens capsule. Okay, this glycens capsule is a very tough and Efficiently working layer. It is not going to let the bacteria enter the liver directly. So, for the given question, the best possible answer and the best 
आंसर इज ऑप्शन सी सब फ्लूड एब्सेस